tonight. So Anthony, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself before we get tonight's webinar started. Sure, so uh, good evening everybody. I'm attorney Anthony Ruin to you from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, those of you that are here in Arizona, uh, hello. Those of you around the country, same to you. Um, I hope everybody has a good Thanksgiving next week. Um, so I'm very pleased to be able to present to you today. I am a uh, attorney here in Arizona. I'm also licensed in New Mexico and I do uh, criminal defense. I also do injury law. Um, but obviously today we're going to be talking about a, a criminal defense topic. And it's, I think it's a very important uh, topic because it is the, you know, talking about the display of a firearm and that happens a lot more than people actually deploying their firearm and pulling the trigger. So we need to talk about it because a lot of, we get a lot of cases here in Arizona um, where that happens to people and they find themselves in a lot of trouble. So I'm also a licensed attorney in New Mexico and um, a little bit about my background. So I'm a former police officer with the Washington DC Metropolitan Police Department um, in, in DC. And I also uh, today currently volunteer with the Arizona Rangers uh, which is the oldest law enforcement agency in Arizona. And uh, they're a volunteer organization now, uh, codified under the Arizona Revised Statutes. And it's a very unique organization. Uh, it's a manpower uh, force multiplier, if you will, uh, to help any local, state, uh, county, and federal agency that needs the help. And so we obviously train to post standards, and uh, we are you know, obviously staying abreast of uh, these, the laws and things that we need to do, you know, and obviously because we're all volunteers, we all need insurance. And this isn't a pitch for firearms, legal insurance, but I'm also a member. So, you know, it's something that's, it's really good to have. Uh, if you don't already have it, or if you're thinking about it, um, get it. So, you know, that's what, uh, last thing, in addition to being a, uh, an attorney, I'm, I'm also a private investigator here, uh, in Arizona. And that helps me, you know, uh, do investigations. I'll actually do investigations uh, from time to time for other attorneys. Uh, for my cases, I like to just do things myself. Um, but I think we're going to have a good conversation tonight. And at the end, we'll take a bunch of questions uh, that have been submitted in uh, prior to us meeting. And so uh, let's get to it. Yeah, you basically just did the, a little intro that I was going to do as well. But thank you, everyone, for joining this sure. uh, month's webinar, but like you said, we'll have a Q&A portion at the end, so make sure to leave any questions, comments in the comments section, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook. But Anthony, you can go ahead and get us started and teach us the differences between defensive display of a weapon and also brandishing a firearm. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Let's get to it. So let me make sure this uh, slide pops up here. Ariana, are you going to put that up there? Okay, fantastic. Yep, we got you. <laughs> so, um, like we talked about, we're going to be talking about the difference between defensive display and brandishing. Okay, now I want to be real clear. Um, we'll skip on to the next slide. I did go jump ahead a little bit uh, in talking about myself. Um, again, Arizona, New Mexico attorney, Arizona private investigator, uh, former police officer. You see the Arizona and New Mexico uh, licensing. So tonight we're going to be talking a lot about Arizona and New Mexico, more New Mex uh, more Arizona than New Mexico. Why? That's where I'm licensed. And if you're licensed, and I see there's some people from Florida, Virginia. Um, I see somebody from Detroit. I'm, I don't know the laws there. Okay, so I'm not going to be able to give you good advice about what the statutes say in your particular jurisdiction. Okay, so, you know, as you're going to see in this disclaimer that just popped up onto your screen, go read the law. It's, the law in each state is obviously different, but there's a lot of similarities. I had an opportunity to read uh, the questions that have been submitted uh, by the attendees, uh, you know, in preparation for this evening's talk. And, you know, there's a lot of similarities. And in fact, a lot of the questions are going to be answered during the seminar. We'll, of course, address them just to make sure that everybody's clear on it. But the laws across the country are very, very similar. You just want to make sure that you are uh, comfortable with and understand the laws in your jurisdiction. Contact an attorney there. 
um, you can go to one of your gun ranges there uh, and speak to the firearms instructors, the CCW instructors. Um, they have a lot, a wealth of knowledge uh, for you in that topic. Okay. So let's talk about what the definition of branding is. You know, I'm an attorney and, and words have meaning. We're always wanting to see what the definition of a particular uh, word is, right? So let's get basic here and look at the Merriam-Webster Dictionary to talk about what the word brandish means. And as you can see here, it means to shake or wave something such as a weapon menacingly, right? And there's a sentence down there that says brandish a knife at them. Um, or two, to exhibit in an ostentatious or aggressive manner um, and that's example, not necessarily related to a weapon, but it's that she was brandishing her intellect. And it's a noun, okay? The act or instance of waving something menacingly or exhibiting something ostentatiously or aggressively, right? The act of brandishing. So in a lot of jurisdictions, okay, brandishing, okay, um, means something different. Arizona does not have a brandishing law. There is nothing in the Arizona revised statutes that address, addresses brandishing a weapon. Um, it gets into, in Arizona, it talks about disorderly conduct with a weapon, uh, aggravated assault with a deadly or dangerous weapon, and things like that. But the act of brandishing or waving around a firearm is what occurred, okay? So that's why I'm saying you want to be very careful with your own state's laws uh, about the act of displaying a firearm. So let's look at that. So to shake or wave uh, in a menacing manner, okay, menacingly or aggressive manner. That's the key, okay? Um, if that happens, then you are more than likely going to be outside of the law. We're going to dig in a little bit more, but let's take a look at some definitions. Again, across, they're, they're different everywhere, but there's a lot of similarities. So as we look at these Arizona definitions, you're going to uh, more than likely see very similar language in your own jurisdiction, okay? So Arizona 1330-101, okay, talks about the definitions. It's, some of this is common sense. A deadly weapon is anything designed for lethal use, okay? It does mean a firearm. It could mean a knife or something like that. Okay, firearm is specifically defined in Arizona as any loaded or unloaded handgun, pistol, revol uh, revolver, rifle, shotgun, or other weapon uh, that is designed to expel or uh, readily be converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive, okay, a bullet. Um, it's clearly defined as to what that is, all right? Now, we talked about Arizona doesn't have any terms of brandishing a uh, firearm in, in this particular state, but there are things that can happen, okay? So one of the things that people can get charged with, all right, is threatening or intimidating someone, all right? So if you look at this statute, it says here that, you know, the defendant threatened or intimidated to cause physical harm to someone for that person's property, okay? The second paragraph doesn't really talk to... Uh, or speak to firearms because it's talking about public inconveniences and things like that. Okay. Now, threatening or intimidating someone, uh, depending on the level, of, in Arizona, it's a misdemeanor. Okay. But if you use a weapon, okay, um, then it can go up all the way to a class three felony. Generally speaking, if you threaten somebody with a firearm, okay. Uh, it's going to be charged as a, as a class six felony, okay? We're going to get into some specific examples in a little while because I know that a lot of the, some of the questions that popped up were specific to, well, what if I pull my firearm out in this manner? We're going to get to it. But keep in mind the definitions that we looked at a minute ago um, along with the, the act of threatening or intimidating someone. This isn't about, that's not about defense, that's about intimidating. It's about being menacing to somebody. Um, so that's something that would help you discern between the difference between the defensive display and the, the brandishing of a firearm. Okay. So again, Arizona 
the next uh, scenario would be an assault. Now, in Arizona, uh, assault can be two things, okay? It can be either number one, uh, intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly causing any physical injury to another person, okay? So actually physically uh, hurting someone. Or number two, intentionally placing another person in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury, okay? Number three is knowingly touching another person with the intent to injure, all right? Number two is where we need to focus, okay? Because as you can imagine, you know, if you pull out a firearm, there's a very good chance that you're going to put somebody in apprehension of imminent physical injury, and you better have a good excuse if you're going to do it, okay? So when we get to the scenarios that we're talking about, it'll I think it'll make a lot of sense. But you have to be careful when you're pulling out that uh, the firearm. What you're going to be doing is possibly putting somebody in that apprehension, which very well could get charged as an assault. Now, you'll notice under this particular statute, under line uh, paragraph number two, it doesn't say anything about a firearm. It just says intentionally placing another person in a reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury. So if I don't need a weapon, if I uh, act in a manner that you're, you know, you think I'm going to hit you, you know, sometimes people might jump or, or, or give somebody the belief that they're going to get struck. Okay. That could be an assault. Now, if you use a firearm, now you're talking about a different statute in Arizona. You're talking about an aggravated assault. Okay. Person commits aggravated assault at the permission. If the person commits an assault as described on the previous slide, if the person uses a deadly weapon or a dangerous instrument. So now in Arizona, you're talking about a class four felony. Somebody in one of the questions that we'll get to later asked, well, you know, how much time do you get if you uh, brandish your firearm? Okay, how much, what's the, the amount of prison you can get? Well, in Arizona, it's a class four felony and the presumptive term for a class four, uh, uh, prison term for a class four felony is two and a half years, okay? That's where the judge would have to start. Now, that's the middle. So it can get worse, it can be aggravated, or it could be mitigated, it could go a little less, right? But, you know, an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon or dangerous instrument in Arizona is two and a half years in prison, okay? So that's something that is, you know, that's a very serious uh, thing that can happen to you. And so you want to be very clear about you know, what you're going to be doing. Okay. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, there is another charge in Arizona that's called misconduct involving weapons. Okay. And the pertinent paragraph is all the way down to the bottom. Okay. Um, where a person commits misconduct involving weapons by knowingly carrying a deadly weapon except a pocket knife concealed on his person or within his immediate control or in the means of transportation, okay, in the furtherance of a serious offense, all right? That could be aggravated assault resulting in physical injury involving the discharge, use, or threatening exhibition of a deadly weapon or dangerous instrument. So basically what in Arizona, what they're saying is you can get an aggravated assault for threatening or intimidating someone with a, with a firearm. But there's another charge called misconduct involving weapons. And that's when you cre uh, commit a crime with a firearm. So it's two completely separate uh, felonies that, you're, that you can catch in Arizona. So in each state that, we're, uh, uh, that you're living in, uh, all the attendees, you're going to want to know specifically what laws you could be uh, running afoul of if you inappropriately display your firearm. In Arizona, there's the threatening and intimidating, which could be a misdemeanor, uh, up to a class six felony, um, or it could go all the way to this misconduct involving weapons or the aggravated assault with a dangerous uh, instrument or deadly weapon. There, there's a, it's a, it's a lot going on. Okay. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, me being a member of this firearms legal protection you know, when you pull out your firearm, you know, it's, there's a very good chance 
that a prosecutor might want to prosecute you. And you're going to, you're going to want to have that type of protection because there's a lot of uh, legal maneuvering that goes on once the government decides to get involved in, in your actions. Okay. So let's move forward and talk about this so we can get to some of the meat of the, uh, of the presentation. The last one I want to talk about, or the next one I want to talk about is justification. Arizona is one of the few states that has actually codified the defensive display of a firearm. And it actually is a law that gives someone justification to do just that. More and more states are coming online. But as you can imagine, you know, the more uh, conservative leaning states are the ones that are heading in this direction. Arizona is ahead of the curve. Okay. Arizona uh, Revised Statute 13.421 says the defensive display of a firearm by a person against another is justified when and to the extent a reasonable person would believe that physical force is immediately necessary to protect himself against the use or attempted use of unlawful physical force or deadly physical force. Okay. That section does not apply to intentionally uh, that person who intentionally provokes another person to use or attempt to use unlawful physical force um, that obviously addresses you know you can't go and provoke somebody and start a fight with somebody and then turn around and try to justify the use of a, the defensive display of a firearm it doesn't work that way okay um, number two uses a firearm during the commission of a serious offense as divine, uh, defined in that section 13706 or a violent crime, okay? If you're committing an aggravated assault uh, with a firearm, you're not going to be able to use the defensive display, okay? C, section C goes on further to say this section does not require the defensive display of a firearm before the use of physical force or the threat of physical force by a person who is otherwise justified in the use of or threatened use of physical force. What section C is saying is that you don't have to do a dis defensive display first in order to, to be uh, in line with the law. You're, the situation that you find yourself in may very well be that you have to use deadly force immediately. Okay. It doesn't say, you know, you have to warn the guy first by showing your weapon to try to get him to back off and then you can use deadly force it doesn't require that. Okay. Because it's just their situations are too fluid. Okay. Um, section D talks about some of the questions we're going to, that have been asked about what is defensive display of a firearm. Okay. Number one is verbally informing another person that the person possesses or has available a firearm. Okay. Somebody posted up uh, in the question that says, you know, how about verbally saying, back off, I have a gun. That's defensive display of a firearm in Arizona, okay? It could also be brandishing under the wrong circumstances, okay? So let's talk about that for a second. So let's say that, uh, for example, you're at a gas pump and you're filling up your car and you're just minding your own business, uh, filling up your tank, and someone comes at you aggressively and they make you believe legitimately that they're going to rob you and take your wallet or perhaps take your, take your keys and take your car, okay? If you, at that point, say, back off, I have a gun, and you can articulate that you actually felt that you were going to be uh, the victim of a, a violent crime, okay, that would be the defensive display, okay? Now, Somebody comes up to you at the, you know, at the same gas pump, but this time maybe they're just panhandling, right? Or maybe they got too close to your car and you didn't like that they got too close to you and you're just annoyed, right? And now you're arguing and you don't like that the person is arguing with you. So you decide you're going to pull your firearm out and, and tell them to back off. That could be interpreted as brandishing. Everybody's circumstances are different. Um, as, an, as a defense attorney, you know, wherever I go on a Friday night and a Saturday night, people start asking these questions. And it's, you know, fact pattern after fact pattern. What about this? What about that? The truth of the matter is, is that 
any particular event that occurs may or may not be charged or considered brandishing, or it could be considered the defensive display of a firearm. The, the issue is, is that if you get into that situation where you're prosecuted, now it's going to be up to a jury to decide if what you did was within the confines of the law. And that's not a place people want to be. Trust me when I tell you, you do not want to be in that situation because people may not uh, agree with you. Okay. When I'm talking about that, you go back up to section A there where it talks about the section that says is justified when and to the extent a reasonable person would believe that physical force is immediately necessary to protect himself. The reasonable person standard is not you. Okay. That's something you need to keep in mind. That's somebody else. It's an imaginary person that they're looking at through the lens of 2020 hindsight. Okay. And that's what they do. So you may feel you're being reasonable there at the scene of, of the incident, but when they, and that when I'm talking about, they, I'm talking about a prosecutor or a jury or a grand jury in some circumstances are going to be looking at to say, okay, th is what this person did reasonable? All right. And if the answer to that is no, in their minds, you're in a lot of trouble. OK, so there's a, an analysis that I'm going to go through here in a little while, in a, in a couple minutes that will help you think through that. OK, um, number two, down under Section D, uh, as far as what the defensive display of a firearm is, is exposing or displaying a firearm in a manner that a reasonable person would understand was meant to protect the person against another's use or attempted use of unlawful physical force or deadly uh, physical force. So what is that? That would be lifting up your, uh, your shirt to display your firearm in, in your concealed carry holster. Okay. Perhaps maybe opening your purse if you're a woman or opening up your jacket pocket to show what you got. Okay. Going back to our example, Depending on what's going on, if it's the, you know, the carjacker coming at you or the, the, the thief, the robber coming to take your wallet at the gas pump, that very well could be the defensive display of a firearm. If it's an argument, if it's something that's not necessarily putting you in immediate threat of physical harm, then you could be brandishing and running afoul of the law. Okay. The last one is, or the third one is placing the person's hand on a firearm. Okay while it's, uh, you know, in your pocket purse or other means of containment. So now you're not only opening your jacket, but you're putting your hand on it. You're not just lifting up your shirt. You're putting your hand on the firearm. Okay. Same set of circumstances. It just depends on what's going on. You have to be able to articulate what it is that was going on. And I'm telling you, like I told you a few minutes ago, laws are different in every state. However, you can Rest assured, if you go do your own research, you're more than likely going to find that if it is, if the defensive display is legal in your jurisdiction, it's going to be very similar to what I just told you. Okay. It is going to um, uh, be different in every state. One of the uh, questions that we have in the, uh, or comments in the comments is, is, is a good, it's a good analysis. So he says, so basically all you can do here is equivocate and waffle and there's no clear cut answer until it actually happens. Yeah. And that's why you want to be very clear on your training. Okay. And make sure that what you're doing uh, is going to be deemed as reasonable. Nobody should ever tell you, you know, you can do this and you're going to be okay because it's not up to that person that's telling you that that's okay. It's going to be up to the jury that's going to, decide whether or not they want to send you to prison. So, you know, talking about these scenarios and uh, different analysis of how to look at things is very important because every fact pattern is different. Everybody's situation. And I've got a couple of uh, three examples to share with you. Two are very similar, but they're examples to share with you of cases that I've actually defended the individuals. Okay. Uh, and when they got themselves into some trouble. All right. So, I told you we were going to talk about this analysis, um, things to think about if you're considering pulling out your firearm, okay? 
Um, some of these things are, are addressed in the questions, um, or the questions or, or the analysis would be addressed by these questions. So let's jump in and uh, take a look at the first one, okay? So here's my thought number one, okay? If you fail to pull out your firearm immediately, you're most likely going to be dead, okay? Being dead is obviously much worse than being prosecuted, so I recommend in that situation you pull out your firearm. Let's go back to the gas pump example, okay? We're not waffling. What we're doing is we're talking about a, a scenario. If you feel, right, that if you do not pull out your firearm immediately, you're going to be dead, you pull it out to, to show somebody that you have a firearm or to pull it out, maybe not necessarily, you know, point it at them, but put it in the low ready. That would be, uh, in my opinion, you're right, you're good to go because you can articulate that you're, you're most likely going to be dead. All right. That is something that um, you would be okay, in my opinion. Okay. Thought number two, or scenario number two, if you will, if you fail to pull out your firearm immediately, someone you love or somebody that you really like a lot will most likely be dead. Okay. As a defense attorney, I can tell you, I would pull out my firearm. So think about it. We're talking about the immediate defense of either yourself or somebody you love. That's consistent with every CCW class, if you've ever taken one that um, that you heard with the information that you're provided. Okay. It's the immediate defense of your own life or the life of somebody else from imminent death. So, you know, if pulling out a firearm is going to prevent that, then you would more than likely be okay. Again, depending on how it is uh, received by the prosecutor, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. You may or may not be prosecuted, but in my opinion, as a defense attorney, you would have a very good defense if you were protecting somebody else from being uh, injured or killed, okay? So thought number four, oh, did we do uh, number three, number two to number four? I'm sorry, that was a, a typo on my, my part, guys. Sorry about that. Um, thought number three, if you fail to pull out your firearm immediately, you will absolutely be disrespected, okay? It's much uh, preferable to be mercilessly disrespected uh, regularly than to be prosecuted, okay? Um, that is something that, you know, it's common sense, guys, all right? Um, you just, you don't need to um, do that. You don't need to uh, obviously worry about being disrespected. We're going to talk about some of the scenarios. Slide number three that you're not going to see here actually got left out on, on the presentation, okay, reads as follows. Um, if you fail to pull out your firearm immediately, you will likely be punched in the face, okay? This is a difficult scenario, but think about it. Generally speaking, you should prefer to be punched in the face than to be prosecuted, okay? I would recommend not pulling out your firearm, all right? A lot of people have an issue with that, um, but again, we're talking about being prosecuted. If somebody is going to punch you in the face, right, you may or may not, um, you know, be justified in pulling out your firearm. They're two completely separate levels of force, okay? Um, when I was a police officer, um, I was doing some defensive tactics uh, training, and we were doing uh, training some civilians. Okay. And it was on weapon retention. And there was an older gentleman that um, it, he, he slipped. Okay. But I had gotten the best of him. I was the attacker in the scenario. And he had fallen and, and he had hit his head and he got hurt. The point that I'm trying to make is that the gentleman made a comment. He said, well, you know, if we'd gone that far, I'd have just pulled out my gun and shot you. Now, it, he was joking. And, but it was actually a very good uh, learning situation because, you know, the answer to him was, well, you know, if you want to get prosecuted. In that particular scenario, I wasn't even armed, right? But depending on how you articulate it, okay, you may or may not be prosecuted. So there's the waffling going on, right? Let me put it to you this way. If somebody is going for your firearm, uh, you can treat that 
okay, as they're going for their firearm. So you're more than likely justified in uh, using deadly force, okay? If somebody's using physical force against you, i.e. my example of punching you in the face, that's not necessarily going for your firearm. And in a fact-specific analysis that would be done by a prosecutor, it just depends. So how do we get, you know, through that, okay? Um, when, if you look at this next slide where it says, you know, there's always a risk of prosecution when you pull out your firearm. You don't know what a prosecutor is going to do. So when you are going to uh, protect yourself or protect somebody that you love, you need to make sure that it's worth being prosecuted for. Remember, there's a difference between being prosecuted and actually being convicted of a crime, okay? Um, as you guys know from the, the, the protection that is offered by Firearms Legal, this is an insurance to commit a crime, okay? It's not a coverage that helps people if they went and committed a crime. It has to be something that was within the confines of the law in order to be able to be protected, okay? So that doesn't mean that even though your actions were uh, done correctly in your mind, that they were you know, done with the right uh, mindset, with you, where your heart was in the right place, a prosecutor can still uh, seriously inconvenience your life. So with each specific scenario, you want to be uh, you know, very sure that what you're doing is reasonable, okay? And that takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of uh, thinking uh, about what the scenarios you could be faced with. And that should be part of your, your training when you're not at the range. You know, what are different scenarios that could pop up, okay? Um, we'll talk about some, all right? So I've got some random suggestions here. Um, take them for what they're worth. You don't have to uh, agree with them. Um, very common sense things. Uh, for me, if you're carrying your firearm, be alert. You shouldn't be drinking. Shouldn't be on uh, taking any drugs. Okay, your judgment obviously gets impaired, and could put you in a position where you are not being uh, reasonable. Okay, um, no alcohol, no drugs. One of the things I also wanted to talk about was securing your firearm at home. I'm not sure about your states. Uh, I can tell you that in Arizona and New Mexico. Fire, a child gets their hand on a firearm, doesn't even necessarily need to go off, okay? You can be charged with felony endangerment or felony child endangerment, okay? The next one is if you pull your gun out on the road, um, you're more than likely going to get prosecuted. We're going to talk about some of these examples in, in a couple minutes, but that it is highly unlikely that a prosecutor would uh, believe that the other guy was going to run you over uh, with his car or that, you know, he was going to ram you with your, with his car and it was going to put your life in danger. If every single time I've seen something like this happen, in fact, it's two of our examples this evening, they're going to get prosecuted. You're going to, in Arizona, you get prosecuted with aggravated assault. Okay. And obviously you should seek to use the least amount of force necessary. That goes back to being the reasonable person. Okay. If you get, um, if the prosecutor or law enforcement think that you're a, a gunslinger and, you know, out to use deadly force right away, that could be construed as being unreasonable. Okay. If you're a person that uses the least amount of force uh, necessary, that can be very, very beneficial to you. Okay. One of the things that um, I want to address is this uh, notion of, you know, what can you do? What can you say? Okay. Obviously, there's, you know, you've got a First Amendment, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, your Fifth Amendment right to, to remain silent. You, you've got a right to remain silent. Um, anything you say can and will be used against you. Okay. Everybody knows that. You see it in movies. You see it in uh, uh, television shows. But sometimes there are things that you need to do to uh, ensure that you're the good guy. So let's go back to this uh, road rage, this pull your gun out on the road uh, for prosecution, okay? What happens is, is if you pull your gun out in defensive display, all right, let's say you're at the gas pump and you pull it out 
and the guy leaves. All right. You, you, you displayed your weapon. You told him you had it, whichever scenario you want to use. My suggestion to you is that you immediately call law enforcement. You dial 911. You tell them where you're at and you tell them what just happened. In this example I just gave you, it would be something to the effect. I'm here at this gas station. I'm pumping gas and this person came up and he, you know, asked me for, told me to give me his wallet. He wanted my car keys. He wanted to steal my car. And let them know that you used your firearm. And when you did that, he left the scene. The reason that you want to do that is because what people do is if you pull your firearm out and they call the police first, so they're the ones that leave and call the cops. Now you, now you're the bad guy. Okay. The, in these types of situations, a defensive display, you always want to call law enforcement because that's what a reasonable person would do. Okay. A reasonable person that was almost, you know, that was threatened or, or almost killed by somebody. Um, when you call the police and report somebody else's actions legitimately, now, now you're the victim. Okay. If you pull your firearm out and, and, and wave it around and going back to our brandishing definition, now you are, you know, you could be the bad guy. And it's all how you are building it and presenting it to law enforcement and to a possible prosecutor. So that's something that you can always do uh, once you've done your defensive display. If you're a victim and you're having to display your, uh, your firearm to protect yourself or a loved one, call 911 and report it because you should only be pulling it out if a crime has been committed against you. Okay. So I want to talk about these case discussions. Um, there's two cases that I, that I defended uh, individuals. One was a, about a year ago and the other one happened more recently. Um, and the one that happened about a year ago, and I'm, I'm not sure who's from Arizona or who's been through Arizona, but I-10 runs through Arizona and, and it goes between Tucson and Phoenix. And in this particular instance, um, my client was driving uh, west or, or northwest as it was uh, coming from between Tucson and Phoenix. And another vehicle was getting too close to him. And the vehicle was, you know, tailgating him, getting right on, on the rear end of his car, speeding around and getting in front and, and brake checking him. And he's not sure what happened. At least that's what, what, what I understood, how this all started. But this person was, was road raging. And so my client got into the glove box and took his uh, gun out of the glove box and, and, you know, waved it, you know, it said he didn't point it at anybody, uh, but he just waved and showed that he had his firearm. And so this person um, drove, they, they drove on, they, they went on down the road. Well, they called the cops and they gave a description of my client's uh, car. And, you know, before you knew it, uh, Arizona Department of Public Safety, Arizona Highway Patrol um, was behind this individual and, and uh, pulled him over. And the story was just as the other individual had described. Okay. So with the, the client, you know, said, yeah, you know, this guy was, was on my rear end. He was, uh, you know, brake checking me. And so I thought that if I showed my gun, then I would, uh, you know, it'd scare him off. Well, it did scare him off, I guess, cause he drove off, but he called the police and, this individual was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, and he ended up pleading guilty to a felony. So, you know, when you have another, uh, when you have a situation where somebody is road raging, you want to um, stay in the vehicle, call law enforcement yourself and report what this other individual is doing and go about your, your way. You don't want to you know, pull your firearm and start waving it like we talked about on the other slide. You do that you're more than likely going to get prosecuted. Okay. Road rage incident number two um, was something very similar. Again, client didn't know why this person was road raging uh, behind him. Um, this other individual though, pulled alongside my client and according to my client displayed his firearm. Okay. And so my client at that point decided, well, he showed me his, so I'm going to show him mine. And he pulled out his firearm and, and waved it at him. And what was reported to me was that the guy, you know, laughed or smiled or whatever. Um, and 
got back, drove backward or, or slowed down and got behind my client. Um, the client pulled over into a parking lot and this guy vanished somewhere. Okay. In fact, uh, I know that the client went uh, into a store to go make a purchase or whatever. Well, when he came out, he was met by law enforcement because the guy that had displayed his firearm first, right, in my opinion, inappropriately, called the police, uh, reported that this driver had flashed his gun at him. And, you know, we said his car is in this parking lot at this store in uh, in Phoenix. And sure as hell, he, uh, you know, he had the gun. He admitted what he did, which, you know, as we've talked about, if you had a right to remain silent, that's a situation where I would recommend in, invoking your right to remain silent. But regardless, there was the car, there was the firearm, and there was the charge of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. So, you know, what he should have done was stayed in the vehicle, not displayed his firearm when the guy waved it like that, and, you know, called 911 himself. But you see, these situations can get very dynamic, right? Um, it's You have to just know what you're doing. Think about these scenarios in your head. A lot of this stuff is common sense, okay? Um, the third example that I want to give you is the Good Samaritan, okay? Now... This was a, it was an auto accident, um, to be truthful with you. Um, no crime had taken place uh, other than there was some reckless driving going on by some other individuals, and they were wanting to leave the scene. And my client, uh, who was a good Samaritan, had come up and was uh, a witness to the accident, and he was trying to um, assist in keeping these people on the scene because when things started to break loose a little bit, they wanted to leave. And so my client said, well, you know, they broke the law and I'm armed. So I'm going to display my firearm, let them know that I have them or have it and let them know that they've got to stay and wait for the police to come. Okay. Didn't pull it out. Uh, didn't point it at anybody. Um, you know, didn't fire any shots, but he displayed it told them that they're going to have to sit there and be quiet and wait for police to come. And when the police did get there, um, he, you know, they told him what had happened and he ended up getting charged with an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And it was, his intentions were, were good, right? In his mind. But the, the question that you have to ask yourself is, is it reasonable for a person to do that when you're all you're talking about is somebody that was involved in a, in a, in a civil traffic infraction that, you know, may or may not have gotten into disorderly because people are arguing, but this is about property, right? And you pull out a firearm to keep people around for a property crime. That's not generally reasonable in the eyes of the state. And so they'll prosecute you for a crime. Now it's my job uh, to argue uh, for you and, you know, make that, that, uh, the argument in the case as to what you did was was reasonable, but you don't want to put yourself in a position where you are charged um, with with a felony. It's, it's 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 avoidable. Okay, so let's move in. Let's get Ariana back on here and go through some of your questions. Okay, I am back on. I'll remove the PowerPoint off and then bring some questions on. And then, um, but before we get started with questions, I was looking at the questions real quick first, but thank you for all this helpful information, Anthony. I know I've learned a lot so far with you explaining the differences between defensive display and brandishing a firearm. And I especially appreciate, and I saw a lot of people in the comments say this too, but the different analysis that you laid out for us, those were really helpful and the different cases that you had. Um, but if you ever do have to defend yourself in any situation with a firearm or any legal weapon, whether that means picking up a cast iron skillet that you have, because those things are pretty heavy, or some type of chair, whatever's near you, you do have to protect yourself in that kind of situation. And you might have to go to trial and also defend yourself, like Anthony was saying earlier, to legally protect yourself, and that may cost a lot of money. So before we do get started with the Q&A portion, I'm going to quickly go over and discuss what Firearms Legal Protection has to offer you in a situation like that. Firearms Legal Protection offers several different memberships to whoever is interested in signing up for legal protection. 
These plans are divided into individual plans and a family plan, which some benefits and pricing vary state by state. For the purposes of this webinar, we will look at our most common plans and benefits that are available in most states. The individual basic plan includes protection in your state of residence. It also includes an uncapped payment of attorney fees for defense of criminal and civil cases. Firearms Legal Protection memberships also extend to all legal weapons, including non-lethal weapons. With the individual basic plan, you also have Defense of Extreme Risk Protection Orders, also known as Red Flag Laws. All plans have access to the 24-7 Emergency Attorney Answered Hotline, so no matter a time an incident may occur, you can count on our hotline and an attorney will pick up for immediate attorney-client privileges. You also have access to the MyFLP mobile app and one of our recently added benefits, expungement of criminal record on non-conviction incidents. Members of all plans also receive access to digital content and special discounts. The next step up is the individual premium plan. This plan has nationwide coverage and also includes all the benefits just mentioned and payment of bail bond premium, payment of expert witness and investigator fees if either are needed in your case. There is also coordination of counseling support, payment of lost wages if you are out of work during trial, and a list of other benefits. We also have the family premium plan to choose from. For those who want the same protection, also apply to their family. For just a little bit more, you get all the benefits that were just mentioned, apply to your spouse and all minor children. If you want more information over these benefits, then check out our Instagram or Facebook page for uploaded explained benefit videos. Remember, if you, friends, or family are not already protected by firearms legal protection, please click the link below for a special discount we offer our webinar viewers. Now, let's get back to today's webinar. Okay, so we'll go over some of the pre-submitted questions now. There's a whole bunch that were submitted this round, but we'll start with Kim's question. In South Carolina, there's a law called pointing and presenting a firearm. What constitutes presenting? If you just show someone your handgun and, it, and it's in its holster, is that considered presenting? So that's, that's a good question. Um, Kim, I don't know if, if you're in here in the in the uh, seminar now. This is a pre-presented uh, question. But, you know, again, I'm not a South Carolina attorney, so I can't tell you what the definition is uh, as interpreted by uh, South Carolina. I can tell you what we talked about earlier was that in, in Arizona, you know, if you show someone your handgun in its holster, is that considered, you use the word presenting, I would say displaying. And so, yeah, I mean, that could be considered the defensive display of a firearm, okay? And that's something that it's all fact specific, okay? We can call it waffling, but it's, it's going back and forth. Real quick, before we move on to the next question, Ariana, somebody had written down there i think it was it's um says what if somebody fires at you from their vehicle and continues to follow um another uh, clayton says sounds like there's no justification for brandishing during a road rage incident clayton you're, you're right brandishing is never okay in any circumstance remember brandishing is the menacingly uh waving of a, of a, of a weapon um the defensive display during a road rage incident like I said earlier, you know, if you're in a car and you're moving and you've got the ability to, to drive away, you're, you might be prosecuted in Arizona. My experience is that you're more than likely going to be prosecuted. Might we get the charges dismissed? Maybe. Uh, would you be found guilty or not guilty at trial? Maybe. But what we're trying to do is give you set, uh, things to think about, like in that analysis to, to prepare you for that. If, if whatever you are protecting, it better be worth being prosecuted for because we don't know what the state's going to do. OK, um, it's uh, about your question about, you know, somebody fires at you from their vehicle, continues to follow. Again, fact specific. Um, I think if you start firing back from a moving vehicle, you know, where are you? Are there people around? Are there other cars around? I don't know if that would be considered reasonable. So that's just, you know, it's a, it's an open ended question. And, you know, attorneys are famous for going. Well, it depends. I don't know, because it, it, it really isn't just a punt. We don't know what a jury's going to do. OK, you have to be out there. You're in the moment. OK, so next question. OK, and then also earlier on in the uh, webinar, someone was asking about waffling. So some of us might not know exactly specifically what that means. So if you don't mind touching on that <laughs> real quick. <laughs> so so that, that's that's going back to the old attorney question of, hey, what do I do in this scenario? And an attorney goes. Well, it depends, right? Um, it, it's a joke in the attorney circle, but that's the thing is that we don't ever want to get pinned down to a certain answer. 
because every single situation that you could ever find yourself in is fact specific. The gas pump situation. Okay, great. You're at a gas pump. Somebody's holding you up. Okay. Somebody's just trying to talk to you. It, it, it's all based on what's going on and how you responded and how that person behaved. It's waffling. So we're just kind of, we're, you know, we're, you're just unsure about what the, what the scenario is going to be. So that, uh, that's what that is. I hope that's a good explanation. I love it. <laughs> okay. We'll go on to the next question. Um, what guidance is there for a reason in brandishing a weapon? The way I was trained is that if I draw, it's because I intend to shoot. Okay. We, Ed, that's a good question. And let's all remember brandishing is never okay. All right. Brandishing is, is outside the definition of what would be reasonable. The defensive display of a firearm um, is, you know, something completely different. And you're correct. You know, I've, I've heard that in my training as well. Do not pull your firearm unless you intend to use it. Okay. There's a lot of good reasons to go by that method of training. However, as in Arizona, Arizona has said it's okay to display your weapon. Okay. If, if it's going to keep you from having to actually use your weapon. Okay. That's using your head. That's common sense, right? Um, if I can get you to go away without actually having to pull that firearm out. Okay. But it has to be reasonable. It ha I have to actually believe that I'm about to have, you're, you've got bad intentions for me. Okay. If I think that, that art can articulate that you've got bad intentions for me. And if I show you that weapon, you're going to go away. You're good to go. Um, might you get prosecuted? Yeah, you can always get prosecuted. I think in, the, in one of the earlier slides, I said, if you know, if you're going to pull your firearm out, expect to be prosecuted. You, you don't know what, th what the state's going to do, but what you want to do is set your attorney up to defend you the, in the best possible manner. You got to look at your attorney as a poker player. Okay. We're just playing the cards that you dealt us. Sometimes clients deal us a really crappy hand. Other times they give us a really good hand. You know, but the, the, the facts and situation are set up by our clients. All right. Let's go on to David's question. Um, is just showing your gun, lifting your shirt to let a threat know you're armed, consider brandishing? Again, we, we've talked about it. Maybe, right? It's if it's if you're being unreasonable and menacing about it. In other words, you're in an argument with somebody at a bar. And you guys, you know, deciding who's got, you know, you're playing, let's pump our chests and see who's a tougher guy. You lift your shirt up and show the firearm, you're brandishing. You're outside, in my opinion, outside of what the the, the confines of the law are. Somebody's being, uh, you know, maybe protect, uh, possibly assaulting someone else or you, and you think that there's the imminent threat of physical harm, displaying that firearm then becomes the defensive display of the firearm. So it's all fact specific. Okay. Okay. Warren's question, when brandishing a weapon, does loaded versus not loaded make a difference? No, it doesn't. Um, I don't know. I don't think we talked about it in one of my uh, previous slides, but it was on there and it talked about a simulated weapon. Okay. So in Arizona, that was an Arizona slide. Um, in Arizona, you can uh, be in a foul of the law and it still be aggravated assault, even with a fake gun. So whether or not the weapon is loaded does not make a difference. Okay. Again, brandishing and defensive display, two separate things. doesn't matter if it's loaded or not. If somebody gets put in the imminent, in, in the apprehension of imminent harm, that enough is in of itself. It doesn't matter if the weapon is loaded or not. Even like a water gun? Well, I think it's the orange like one, <laughs> it's the orange ones with the, you know, thing, maybe not, but you know what I mean. Right. Okay. Clayton's question is brandishing just showing a gun or is it pointing a gun at another person? So it could be both. Okay. Um, show your, you show your weapon and it's inappropriate. It could be brandishing, um, pointing it. You're definitely pointing your weapon at somebody else when you shouldn't be uh, is brandishing. So it, it could be, it could be both. Okay. Loretta's question. If someone is coming towards you with ill intent and you just put your hand over your concealed weapon and verbally warn warn them don't do it would that be considered threatening or brandishing well reading that question um i think in exactly as the way loretta was describing it i think that if you know we talked about this as the different scenarios you know um if you think that somebody is coming towards you with ill intent i think that's reasonable okay um don't do it right just put your hand on it and you're good to go 
if you're in an argument with somebody and you know the don't do it is don't take my beer that could be brandishing okay there's no there's no intent right but you get my point it really it's fact specific okay it could be defensive display it could be brandishing if, go back to the analysis that i gave you guys okay if you think you're going to die pull your weapon out if you think somebody else is going to get hurt or die pull your weapon out somebody punched you in the face that's a hard one right because that's not that's not uh necessarily a deadly weapon right getting punched in the face are they going for your weapon could be right it's all fact specific somebody insults you disrespects you walk away it's you know showing your firearm is going to do it ron's question when is it okay to show a firearm in the holster in order to de-escalate a situation is it okay to make a gesture showing you have a firearm to de-escalate the situation okay in a defensive display scenario again you feel that your uh life is in danger somebody else's life is in danger both of those things would be okay okay in a situation where a reasonable person wouldn't think that it was uh, uh appropriate then you could be a foul of the law and be brandishing your firearm somebody and I, I love the comment they said you know i don't know if common sense is is appropriate for the seminar it actually is i'll argue with you all day long on that one because in those situations that you know that training that common sense that you have to think about um in a situation um could be the difference between being prosecuted and not okay thomas's question can open carry be considered brandishing um i guess that would be state specific again i can't uh speak to every single jurisdiction i think there are some states like uh, let's let's take you know new york and, and california i'm not going to pick on those states but, that's uh, okay pick on them. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know i don't know their laws there but I, i'm pretty sure if you're open carrying in that state um, it could be considered brandishing um, arizona arizona is an open carry state there are a lot of open carry states now so the answer in those states would be no um clint's question what situation would justify defensive display in arizona and what do they define as defensive display moving over argument to show in the holster or drawn in low ready position i i think we address that in the questions and so i'm not trying to just uh, breeze over your question clint but i mean we literally i'm an arizona attorney so we did talk about the arizona definitions and exactly what the justification law is um you know showing it into the right circumstance under the right circumstances is fine drawing it in low ready is is okay you know it, it just as long as the, the you can articulate that you were being reasonable you would be okay all right we have joshua's question can you comment on california law and the distinction between brandishing a firearm and defensive display of a firearm sorry joshua i can't comment on california law i, I don't know i'd be lying to you so I, I don't know leave, leave california is my answer <laughs> Okay, we have Rohit's question. Can inadvertent printing of a concealed weapon be charged as brandishing? Another state specific question. Where are you? Okay, in Arizona? No. I mean, you can, you know, in Arizona is a constitutional carry state. You don't even need a CCW to conceal here. Okay, it just depends really on where you are. But um, so the answer to that in my state is no, it might not be the, the same where you're at. Go check your laws out. Jason's question, what about brandishing during an unprovoked road rage situation, like your vehicle being blocked by a person and they get out and aggressively approach your vehicle? Okay, that's um, that's a good question, Jason. Um, and that's one where a lot of scenarios can pop up. Um, we talked about, you know, our driving uh, situations earlier. Don't ever put yourself in a position where you're going to get blocked in. That's, that's you know. Um, if you leave the area, do not put yourself in a situation where you're going to get blocked in. Um, if somebody gets out and aggressively approaches your vehicle, are they armed or not? Um, my advice to anybody in a road rage situation is to never leave your vehicle, ever. Stay in your vehicle. Look, if somebody didn't block your vehicle in, okay, um, and you can get out of there, they're out of their car. Get, get out of Dodge. Leave, okay? Um, if they have a weapon and they're approaching you, right, and you're blocked in, you very well could articulate that the use of deadly force was reasonable at that point in time. It's all fact specific. There was this video I saw, 
and there was it was like a tunnel and there was like the tunnel wall and there was the median and there was it was kind of a road rage situation or someone was trying to attack the person behind them but they stopped their car and there was no way for their car to like kind of get through and there was all these men that walked out of the vehicle and had guns on them and then started approaching the vehicle and the vehicle had nowhere to go so they just went forward and they went right just drove right onto the vehicle through whatever crack they could and then the people move out of their way but it was an intense video yeah. i don't you can't you can't go backwards and then you can't get out of your vehicle because then they would be could yeah. actually attack you right there so he just, just went for it and drove the vehicle through from that type of situation ariana the victim's going to call 911 right away right oh yeah uh, call 911 and you know i don't know if maybe they're in, i don't know where that video is from if it's mexico or some other country <laughs> i don't know i can't talk to that but you know here you know, you'd leave the area and, and immediately call 911 you ran over oh, yeah. somebody in, it, in that situation probably be okay yeah scary video yeah but we'll go on to james's question how long can a person go to jail for brandishing a weapon that was unjustified so it's again that's all state specific james um earlier i mentioned you know aggravated assault with a deadly weapon in arizona is a is a class four felony that's a presumptive sentence of two and a half years um, if in Arizona it could go higher, if somebody's gotten in trouble before in a, in a, with a felony, it could be worse. But generally speaking, in Arizona, it's two and a half years. That varies by each and every uh, scenario. Okay. We have two more questions. Edward's question. Is the act of drawing your weapon either a form of assault or considered illegal? Well, it's yes and yes or could be right so is the act of drawing your weapon either a form of assault um the answer to that is is yeah it, it is but again in arizona it, there's a justification for it okay so you know you are uh, doing something but the, the law is saying you can do it okay it's kind of like that same scenario and again can't speak to every state in arizona if somebody's trying to steal your wallet you're okay to punch them right somebody's trying to rip you know steal your property you can use physical force to stop a crime you know we're talking about deadly force here and, and but so the act of drawing your weapon yeah you know it's it, it's justified it, it and the rest of your question is it considered illegal it depends why are you displaying your weapon okay why are you drawing your weapon okay last question eric's question should you report defensive brandishing incidents to the police and if so what should you say well, we, we, we covered that, Eric. Good question. You were ahead of the game. Um, the, ad, the answer is when you um, do defensive display, okay, again, there's no such thing as defensive brandishing, all right? Brandishing is bad. Defensive display is good. Um, when you do that, as I told you earlier, you should always call the police. Victims call the police. Arguably, you're having to do the defensive display of your firearm because you were just victimized. So, yes, and what you should say is, is report where you're at okay um and what just happened and that you need law enforcement right away fill in the pieces once law enforcement gets there okay um the less you say is actually better on the 911 recording in my personal opinion there could be attorneys that would tell you differently but you know reporting that an issue uh, happened you know you displayed your firearm uh, even perhaps maybe you have a firearm that way law enforcement knows um you may also consider describing what you're wearing okay so that they know who you are okay but remember in my opinion victims call the police um criminals don't so you always want to be the guy calling the police in that type of a situation okay okay well i guess that concludes this webinar if you any of you guys have any additional questions please email marketing at firearmslegal.com but anthony do you have any last comments or anything you would like to share no, you know, I just wanted uh, to say thank you to you, Ariana, and thank you to each and every one of you that gave me an hour of your time. You know, it's dinner time. I know that you guys have better things that you might want to be doing. And so I, I, I'm very honored that you chose to give me an hour of your important time. And, you know, just a reminder, you know, use your heads out there. Uh, do as much training as you possibly can with your firearm. Um, not only handling it, but thinking of scenarios. Um, if you ever do have any questions, um, you know, you can, you know, certainly consult with a lawyer. Again, my name is Anthony Ramirez. I'm licensed in Arizona and New Mexico. L my contact information isn't on there, but, you know, please 
you know, reach out to me and uh, find me, and I'd be happy to, to give you a minute or two or, or talk to you about your case. Um, and I really thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, spending your time with me tonight. Well, thank you, Anthony, for joining us tonight for tonight's webinar and sharing your extensive knowledge over this topic. But everyone, remember to click the links in the caption below, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, to get protected at a discount rate and also to let us know what you would like to see in any of our future webinars. And if you enjoy content like this, uh, just make sure to like our Facebook page and hit the subscribe button on YouTube and that little bell so you can receive notifications whenever we do go live for webinars like this in the future. But also, we have a link down there. Uh, if you liked Anthony's presentation, please leave him a review as well because he did such a great job presenting for us tonight. But we all hope you have a great rest of your night. And remember, protect yourself. We'll protect you. And we'll see you, kind of not really see you since this is all virtually, but we'll see you on the next one for our December webinar as well. Good night, Take care, everybody. everybody. Take care. Have a good night.